Um, so yeah, now I actually work for Mayhec. I've been here for about um, two years and I'm a family practice doctor. Um, and I got interested in vaping after I started to realize how much of a hot topic it was um, and kind of have made a couple of slide decks and done some presentations for communities and for providers. Um, first of all, I have no disclosures. And here's kind of our objectives here coming up. Um, what is vaping? How does it differ from smoking? The scope of the problem? Talking more about teenage use and focusing on this, as we all know, it's an epidemic. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Evoli. I know that uh, Dr. Jones did that earlier yesterday. And then treatment and resources that are available. So e-cigarettes are also called in electronic nicotine delivery systems. Um, as you can see there, there's um, this is a picture of e-cigarettes that were collected from 10 different North Carolina high schools. And you can see how they all look kind of different. Um, it's hard to tell really what is a e-cigarette versus a flash drive versus other things. So the names for them are, there's tons of them. You may hear them referred to as vape pens, mods, sigalikes, egos, shisha pens, personal vaporizers. And these are some of the brands that are out there. Um, the main one that you probably have heard of is Juul and they have a, or they did have a huge market share. Um, there's also some other new um, devices that are out there that we'll talk about later on in the, in the talk here which is called the Puff Bar. That's the newest one that just came out, um, not probably one to two months ago. So quick history about um, e-cigarettes. They were introduced in 2007 in China by a guy named Han Lick. Um, he came up with these as a, a possible way to get uh, folks to quit smoking. Um, his father passed away from lung cancer and he was a smoker himself and thought he would try to um, invent something that would help. So initially thought to be less harmful than cigarettes, since cigarettes have 7,000 chemicals um, and close to um, 70 known carcinogens. And then it's designed and marketed to help with uh, tobacco cessation in adult, is how it was initially designed. Does it help adults quit smoking? Um, kind of mixed results here. You guys may have remembered a 2019 study that came out in New, New England Journal of Medicine um, showing the one-year abstinence rates um, for folks with e-cigarettes was about 18% versus nicotine replacement therapy was about 10%. However, they didn't take into account that 80% of those e-cigarette users were still using e-cigarettes at the time of um, this study being con concluded, and then 9% of the nicotine replacement were still using nicotine replacement therapy. And then a meta-analysis done the year before, looking at 26 different studies, show adult smokers who use e-cigarettes were 27% less likely to stop smoking than those who do not use e-cigarettes. Um, and then last, actually this year, the Surgeon General report, which is a huge um, thing about tobacco cessation, 200 pages or so, if you want to read it, um, inadequate evidence to conclude that e-cigarettes um, increase smoking cessation. And what we've seen in a lot of folks that try to use e-cigarettes um, to quit smoking is that they actually become dual users and continue to use conventional cigarettes plus e-cigarettes. So e-cigarettes and vaping products are not regulated by the FDA as a drug. Um, they're regulated as a tobacco product, which is a lot less strenuous guidelines. They're not considered a treatment by the FDA. Um, they're now a $19 million industry. That may be different numbers now, um, but somewhere around that. And um, many vaping companies are owned by big tobacco. Pretty much all of them are. Um, and I don't know if any of you guys know who owns Juul, but it's actually Altria, which is the parent company for Philip Morris. And they bought them out maybe two or three years ago. So as we all know, uh, teen use has really um, peaked. Um, this kind of shows in the blue the teen use and how it rose from 2011 to 2018. And then adult use stayed pretty consistent at about 3%, whereas adult teen use um, increased astronomically. And now we're at that epidemic status. Um, so 27.5% of 12th graders uh, reported use in the last month. Um, 10, over 10% 10 reported daily use, and then even down to eighth graders or 10.5%. And uh, anecdotal stories from um, our area, the Western North Carolina, is that even fourth graders have been caught using e-cigarettes. So what do teenagers say about the number of kids vaping? I've participated in a fair amount of uh, prevention work with some teenagers, and uh, most of them will say at least 80% of their classmates that are in um, high school have tried um, uh, vaping or juuling. Um, I talked to another uh, teenager who said one of the games she does is counts how many little pods she finds on her way to the school, um, from the parking lot to her school, and she usually finds about 30 um, that have just been discarded. So it's a lot of kids that are using it even more than I think that 25% um, of folks. 
Um, so most common reasons youth use cigarettes, um, just think about that to yourselves. Um, one of the main reasons is uh, used by friend or family members, how they get introduced to it. Uh, a big, um, obviously, reason is the ability of the flavors. And 17% believe they are less harmful than other forms of tobacco, such as cigarettes. So 80% of tobacco users um, in this age group of 12 to 17 year old reported first using with a flavored product. And you can imagine, I'm sure you guys have seen some of the, the ads that are out there, but the flavors like OMG, which is orange, mango, guava, they're not targeted for adults, but really for um, teenagers. This is a quote from Thomas Frieden, former director of the CDC. The minute you saw cotton candy flavors come on, everything should have been done to get these things off the market. Um, and the, we had the option as a country in 2016, um, Congress did to ban flavors and they uh, chose not to. And a lot of that was done based on the e-cigarette lobby, which lobbied to allow these to still continue. So this is a, a graph just looking at youth views on e-cigarettes. You can see that dark blue, it's a little hard to see, but that's flavoring only. So two thirds of um, youth thought that it was flavoring only in their e-cigarettes when they started versus um, you know, some of them thought it was nicotine, some were marijuana and some did not know. And this was in the age group under age 18, and under age 18, but even those young adults thought similar that most of it was just flavoring. Did advertising play a role? I'm sure you guys can uh, say yes. I'll talk a little bit about that. So these are past tobacco ads. And if y'all um, really want to nerd out, there's a lot of cool ads on um, Stanford's website where they have this whole um, history of tobacco ads um, from now until present. So these are ads back in the 1920s and 30s and 40s when we um, as physicians even said, maybe you should smoke. So this talks a little bit about target advertising to which person. Um, this is my dad here, who is a 70 some year old guy who's actually a retired physician who has smoked daily since age 20. He's got helped when he was, um, they were in his MRE when he was in the army. And so just keep that in mind. And then this is my nephew who is um, 19. And so when I do community, community talks, I always talk a little bit about, you know, who was the, who are these ads targeted to? So when you look at these, um, who do you think they're targeting? Um, I, you know, you can obviously tell it's, it's targeted towards teenagers. They even had these launch parties Jewel did back in the day um, where they would give out free jewels to anybody um, and then, you know, would get people hooked. Now, um, since Jewel's gotten in trouble and the other um, e-cigarette industry leaders, they are doing a lot more um, targeted advertising for, for smokers trying to quit. This just shows, aside from the CDC, just showing um, e-cigarette ads and how prevalent they are. Um, this study is just from 2016, but you can imagine even from there, here, there's been even more um, prevalence of e-cigarettes ads, whether it be in retail stores or internet or television or Instagram um, or any of the other social media outlets. So why do we care about youth use? So we all know that one out of 10 tobacco users start before age 18, or sorry, nine out of 10 tobacco users start before age 18. Um, adolescents who use e-cigarettes are more likely to use conventional cigarettes as well. And it's also associated with other substances of use. So smoking and um, tobacco are linked to close to half a million deaths each year in the US. Smoking increases the risk of heart disease and lung stroke by two to four times and lung cancer by 25 times. And if no one in the US smoked, one in three cancer deaths would be prevented. This is all data from the Surgeon General's recent report. So let's talk a little bit about vaping and get you guys caught up to speed in case you don't know. So just take a look at this picture here and see if you can spot the vaping devices. This is just looks like a kid that just emptied out his or her backpack. So just see if you can picture them and, and, and circle them in your mind. You can see those are the ones that are devices. One kind of looks like a pen up there. One looks like a flash drive, or two of them do. Um, the kind of circular ones are a pretty popular one, and those kind of look like those little water um, flavoring devices. 
there's even been ones that have uh, shown to be like a, a hoodie that you can get that has a vaping um, apparatus in it's embedded in its um, hood. So what's so scary about vaping is that um, nicotine salts are the main thing that are in Juul as well as most of the other um, e-cigarette devices as well. Um, so this nicotine salt results in less irritation in the back of the throat. Um, so that's one of the main reasons that, that kids maybe think of not using is that irritation that they get, but it, this doesn't seem to happen with Juuls. And the salts enter the bloodstream faster. And um, there's a, per the manufacturer of Juul, um, 2.7 times faster than conventional cigarettes. So the high hits you sooner. So Juul was introduced in 2015. It was actually um, two Stanford um, uh, graduate students that they came up with it. Um, now represents, you know, about three quarters of the market share. This may have dropped some recently with recent legislation changes, but it's still fairly up there. Um, and it's bought by Altria, as I said before. Valued it um, lots of money. Um, I'm not sure the value of that now, but um, this was, the slide deck was done a couple of months ago. So, and the flavors that they used to have um, prior to October were cream, mango, and fruit. Um, now they only have Virginia tobacco, classic tobacco, and menthol. Up until a couple months ago, they also had mint. Um, Mint has been banned recently by um, Congress. So contents of nicotine vapor. So obviously it's got nicotine and a lot of other things that we don't really understand um, completely. And there's lots of studies going on, um, lots of them at UNC actually right now. But one of the things that uh, we think about are the flavorings. So all the flavorings that are in these uh, devices are approved for oral ingestion, but none, none of them are approved, are approved for you know, ingestion or respiratory inhalation. So we don't really know what happens when these things are inhaled. Um, one of the things, the studies that came out back a long time ago was this flavoring that was used for buttered popcorn, and there was an outbreak of bronchiolitis obliterans um, at this plant that was making butter popcorn flavoring for um, microwave popcorn. And so that's one example of um, a flavoring that caused some illnesses, and that's why um, bronchiolitis obliterans is called popcorn lung. So nicotine content, does anybody know, this is a jewel pod on the side there, does anybody know the amount of nicotine that's in one of these? So it's actually equal to about a pack of cigarettes. And this brings up the question, like, could cigarettes actually be better than a Juul? And the thought behind that is that with a cigarette, you hit an endpoint. You smoke one, and then um, you have to kind of go into your pocket, pick out another one to smoke another one, whereas the Juul, you can just keep, keep hitting it over and over again. And you'll hear stories about kids sometimes going through multiple pods per day. So, I've heard there are products with 0% nicotine. I'm sure you've heard that from your patients and um, you've seen them out there as well. So there's pods that contain anywhere from zero to 24 milligrams of nicotine as advertised. And these zero milligram products make up uh, less than 1% of the market share. And the average nicotine concentration over the past five years has actually doubled in a lot of e-cigarettes. What about products claiming zero milligrams of nicotine? Do you think this advertising is true? So this was a small study um, done, I can't remember which institution, but basically just looking at different um, things that were out there that claimed to be zero milligrams of nicotine. And all of them, well, most of them had nicotine in them. And you would think maybe just a small amount, right? But there were some that had actually levels up to one pack of cigarettes. So they were advertised to have zero, but they actually had enough nicotine that was equivalent to one pack of cigarettes. So now we'll talk a little bit about Avali. Um, I know that Dr. Jones talked a little bit about this yesterday as well from the CDC standpoint. This is a quote that I like. This is from a, a mom of a teenager who actually suffered a vaping related illness. So if this was romaine shells, romaine lettuce, the shelves would be empty. This is kind of a comparison of um, a recent romaine outbreak about uh, a year and a half ago versus Avali. So there's been 2,000, close to 3,000 cases across the United States. Um, in the initial cases, approximately 96% were hospitalized, 68 deaths. 
And then if you look at Romaine, there were 62 cases, 25 hospitalizations, and zero deaths. But yet, all the Romaine lettuce was pulled from the shelves that day, whereas with Evali, um, the Trump administration decided not to pull all um, vaping products. So what we know um, is a probable link to vitamin E acetate, uh, which is safe for oral consumption and application on skin, but we don't know what happens when it's inhaled. Um, it was added to a lot of those dank vape devices um, and acts as a thickening agent. Um, so those are both in THC containing products as well as nicotine. Um, there's some other compounds out there, but more than likely it's the vitamin E acetate. So when you're thinking about Ivali, um, definitely think about history. Um, I mean, it's still out there. It's not as prevalent as before, but just definitely think about it when you're seeing a patient with um, respiratory symptoms or even sometimes you see some GI symptoms, fevers with it. Um, make sure to ask about e-cigarette and, and um, other products used. And make sure to get a pulse ox, consider a viral panel. Probably at this point, you'll consider COVID testing as well. Um, chest x-ray, consider a CT and then consider admission if their pulse ox is low or respiratory distress. Um, treatment is, is fairly supportive unless you're concerned for a uh, secondary infection when you wanna cover for community card pneumonia or antivirals. This is a picture of, of the lungs from the New England Journal of Medicine, kind of the preliminary report. So 91% had an abnormal chest X-ray and then the CT scan 100% had um, abnormalities and a lot of these patients um, went on to develop acute respiratory distress syndrome. So once these patients are discharged, if they are admitted, make sure to have them follow up within 48 hours, check pulse ox, um, ensure abstinence from baby and tobacco products, um, talk to them about connections to getting, um, whether it's nicotine replacement therapy or some, some other FDA approved, um, and we'll talk about that later, FDA approved medications for tobacco cessation. Um, two to four weeks later, you want them to follow up with pulmonology and then the question of long-term effects, we really don't know. I haven't been able to find any definitive data that shows that patients that vape are more likely to suffer severe COVID infections, but um, that link is proposed. So now we'll talk a little bit about nicotine use disorder in adolescents and how to screen for it and treat. So what do you do as providers? Um, do you recommend e-cigarettes for smoking cessation? Hopefully not. I know I used to think that they weren't as bad a couple of years ago, um, but now definitely try to point patients away from them. Um, and a lot of patients are pretty aware of, of the dangers of vaping. So, um, you know, if the patient asks about using e-cigarettes, how do you counsel about maybe we don't know enough about vaping yet and that it really hasn't been shown to be effective, that most people become, you know, dual users, they aren't able to get off their vaping devices. And I think also to counsel them that the ones that are out there that show that they have zero milligrams of nicotine may not. And I think this is a big thing. Think about how your EMR or EHR screens for nicotine use. I know ours in Mayhek was mainly just asking about cigarettes and, you know, tobacco and patients would always say no. But then when you would ask about vaping or juuling or use some of the other words out there, you would really see, oh yeah, well I do that. You know, so there's a big problem about how we're screening and picking up these folks. Um, this is one of the screeners that's out there for those of y'all that do pediatric care, you've probably seen it before. Um, this is the CRAFT plus N questionnaire. Um, this is designed for 12 to 21 year olds um, to assess um, um, illicit substance use. So, um, question number four says, use any tobacco or nicotine products, for example, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, hookahs, or smokeless tobacco. And then the one above it does mention sniff, huff, or, huff, or vaping. But I think, you know, this is a great screening question, but it definitely um, would recommend the provider kind of talk a little bit more and use some of the languages out there that um, kids are using. So yeah, as I said before, make sure your language is correct. Cigarettes, vaping, e-cigarette use, and juuling. Most teenagers know juuling. I was talking this over with another provider that I work with at Mayek, and she was telling me that her son, um, she was asking, you know, do you know about e-cigarettes, and do you know anybody that uses? And he's like, no, I don't know. And then she said, how about juuling? And he said, oh, yeah, lots of people do that. So just, just keep that in mind, um, that most folks may not know what you're talking about when you say e-cigarette use. 
This is um, a study that was done um, last year. It was published in JAMA Pediatrics and was looking at um, teenagers in Massachusetts. It was uh, Medicaid enrolled um, folks. And so it looked at 81,000 youth and based on um, you know, chart review were found to have a nicotine use disorder. And the bottom line is we're not doing a good job as providers and screening folks and then um, linking them to treatment. So 94.6% received no treatment. And um, of the 4% that did receive treatment, or a little bit over 4%, 4% um, got counseling and 1.2% got um, pharmacotherapy. Um, now, that being said, no medications are FDA approved under age 18 um, for the treatment of uh, tobacco or nicotine use disorder. So just keep that in mind. That is including nicotine replacement. Um, and you may have seen this. This came out um, last week, but the USPSTF um, did a B recommendation um, to educate and counsel um, teenagers to prevent um, initiation of using tobacco products or nicotine products. Um, and there's insufficient evidence to offer cessation to this group. So there's a story that we got from um, one of the teenagers that I um, worked with in some of these prevention um, task forces. And um, she was actually sitting down to take the MCAT and she didn't realize she'd been juuling a lot and didn't realize how terrible addicted she was or you know, having, she started having nicotine withdrawal while she was taking the MCAT. And so she actually had to leave the test and go home. And then the next time when she went, she had to wear a, um, a nicotine replacement patch to be able to sit down and focus enough to take the test. So I think a lot of teenagers don't really understand um, how much nicotine affects them and how um, addicted they may become. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of Luca Kennard, um, but he is a great um, speaker. He, he's probably 18 by now, but, or maybe 19, but he's a high point teenager that um, had to actually go to inpatient rehab um, because of his uh, use disorder with, with vaping. He was using about four to six pods per day um, and then didn't realize how addicted he was and he ended up um, having a seizure. They don't know whether that was due to his nicotine use or not, but he ended up um, having to be sent to a, um, inpatient rehab for about 46 days and then was discharged. Um, and now he goes around the community um, really telling folks their story and trying to work with um, other teenagers um, other groups to try to help these folks quit um, juuling and also um, help to prevent first use. If you get a chance um, you can probably google him and find um, his YouTube um, a couple of YouTube videos where he tells his story. So behavioral therapy still is standard of care for youth. Um, Well-established um, interventions include CBT and family-based therapy. Um, probably effective is motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement therapy. And unknown is this text-based cessation apps. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. This one's called Ditch Jewel. It's through the Truth Initiative. Um, and I've taken a screenshot of that there. Um, I actually signed up for this and was pretty impressed. They sent a lot of um, text messages, probably about one or two a day. Um, and it was, it was interesting to see how, how it works. So nicotine replacement therapy, as I said before, FDA approved for over age 18, but prescription may be um, needed um, under age 18, maybe 21 now with recent legislative changes um, with the tobacco age going to above 21, but I think it's still, um, I'll just looking this up and you can purchase it over the counter if you're over age 18. And so we all know that um, CBT plus nicotine patches were associated with higher abstinence rates for adolescents. Bupropion. So it's FDA approved for tobacco use, but not for under age 18. There's two adolescent studies. These are about 10 years old. Um, higher quit weights than placebo on 300 milligrams per day, 10% versus 13%, but still not great numbers. And then bupropion plus contingency management um, was more effective than um, either alone. Varenicline, which I can never say appropriately, but um, it's FDA approved for adults, as we know. Um, for teenagers, there's not a ton of data out there. This is a study, uh, most of the studies are actually being done out of MUSC, um, and this is a recent um, RCT that was published last year. Uh, quit rate was about the same, looking at three-month abstinence. Um, Chantix group was um, more likely to report an earlier cessation. Um, the nice thing about it is that varenicline didn't show any more side effects, and there was no concern for increased neuropsychiatric side effects with varenicline, which is, which is good news. The data is not great that it helps, but there aren't any side effects, so maybe with further testing, this will be more of an option for patients. So just thinking about what you can do as a provider now. 
so there has been a lot of success with cigarettes. Um, the downward trend of um, smoking with conventional cigarettes has really gone down. And the thought is that is because of increased pricing, smoke-free laws, access to cessation treatment, and then anti-smoking ad campaigns. We mentioned success um, legislatively too. So in, um, in October, Juul suspend all of their flavors except for mint and tobacco. And then they had to expand, like, you know, get rid of mint recently. And then um, at the end of last year, they raised the legal age to buy tobacco products to 21. And then at the first of this year, um, you may have remembered this, but it seems like a lifetime ago, but flavors were limited to menthol and tobacco. This is a big problem though, is that it only covers disposable cartridges like Juul, and it does not cover the refillable e-cigarettes um, or these fully disposable e-cigarettes, and that menthol is still left in, which is similar to mint, and a lot of teenagers are switching to that. So enter disposable e-cigarettes. And if you ask any teenager, they'll tell you about these things called puff bars, which are that kind of, um, green one in the middle of the screen there. So this is a loophole in the flavor van, which allows for these disposable e-cigarettes. So they look like jewels, but they're completely disposable. Those are some of the names, Posh, Stig, Bitty Stick, Blue, you may hear of these from your patients. They're actually cheaper than a jewel, seven to $10 each. Jewels are about 10 to $13. And so make sure to ask about these. And um, I think the big thing that we need to do as providers is push for legislative change to get rid of these. Um, so there's this U.S. House bill um, that basically tries to, and you can go look at this in more detail, but basically it tries to get rid of these completely disposable e-cigarettes. These are some national resources um, that are out there. Um, the Truth Initiative is actually from the American Legacy Foundation, which was set up in 1998 with the Master Settlement Agreement from the Big Tobacco. They've got some great resources. Um, Smoke Free is a great one. Catch My Breath, which does a lot of evidence-based prevention curriculum. American Lung Association has a lot. And then the North Carolina Tobacco Prevention um, Branch has a lot of great resources in a um, weekly email called Tobacco Ripple Effect, which has a lot of news out there as well. And I think I got in under the wire. Yeah, so perfect. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me. I know that was kind of a 30 minute blitz, but um, hopefully you learned a little bit.